system gets better, your cardiac output's better, your lactic acid is going to do what? Go down. Go down. Go down. Go down. I need to just make sure you're putting all these pieces together because we've learned a lot about labs, but now can you apply them in different situations? Okay. If you know what the lab is about, if you know the concept of the lab, you probably understand it. So lactic acid means what kind of metabolism? Yeah. Anaerobic, which means without what? Oxygen. Oxygen. So when someone's cardiac output improves, when someone's perfusion gets better, their lactic acid level goes back down. down. All right. So do you know what to expect from this patient? And you might want to freak out when you accidentally find it again. That's why I showed you this. Now I'm skipping through option A because we're not teaching that today. And then we're going to cardiac, which is the main part of your objective. All right, we've been talking a little bit about assessment, right? And I told you already on day one that you're going to have to kind of know a little bit about the norms of the pediatric patient, right? Just kind of have a good ballpark. Don't memorize it. Memorizing stuff is not helpful sometimes. Being able to apply it is what you need to do. So look at, at these same old objectives that we have for everything else. Look at number five in particular. It says cardiac stress test. Did we cover that already? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Cardiac catheterization. Did we cover that? Yes. Radionuclide imaging is just that isotope that they inject before the stress test. Okay. At St. River, um, you know, they have a name for it. At another hospital, they have a different name for it. They call it myocure at St. River on the mark. And that's just the radioisotope or tracer that they use so that when they put you in that nuclear medicine machine, if they can see if you're not confusing a certain part of that heart muscle, it'll be a different color on the um, image. It's really cool. So if you ever get the opportunity to see that. All right, am I going to test you on that? No, you don't do it. We don't do that as a nurse. Why can we do as a nurse in the, uh, when we're doing stress tests? If you're the nurse doing the stress test, you may push the isotope. It's no big deal. All right? It's not a medicine. That's it. What well, is? It's not. There's really nothing you can do. Most people don't react to it. I want you to know that. All right. If I say angiography, what does that mean? It's the same thing as what? Angiogram. Arteriogram. A cardiac path is an angi is an angiogram. Angiogram and arteriogram are the same thing. Okay. That clarifies something. All right. Keep going. Number six. What? What arrhythmias are we covering? A fib. I mean, B fib. Dead ones. <laughs> um, they're not all dead. Um, ventricular, heart blocks, specifically third degree, which is also known as. Dead. Uh, no. It's not. Here it is, but they're not dead. But you could write this. This is not healthy. You got a patient. You have to. Yes, third degree heart block is the worst form of heart block, and it's known as complete heart block, is what we would call it, complete heart block, which means the atrium is pacing itself, and there's no connection to the ventricles, and the ventricles are pacing itself, and there's no connection there, and a lot of times, after complete heart block, They'll block completely on out. <coughs> they have to be paced. They have to be paced. And what's interesting about complete heart block, and this is just, y'all, we're going to get to this and cover it again and again. You know how much Cooper does you. She's going to tell you stuff about 15 times during the day. Why? Is this on a Well, it's adults learn from repetition. And you have to hear it, you have to say it, and you have to apply it. Okay? And every one of you learn differently. Some of you learn from listening, some of you learn from looking. So I gotta make sure I'm covering everybody, all right? Now, complete heart block is also known as third, third degree heart block. And third degree heart block is also known as complete, complete heart block. block. And I tell you that because it's according to where you go to work and what they call it, you need to know. All right, so we're covering all dead rhythms. So let's talk about them. <clears throat> dead rhythms. <laughs> All right, there are there are two divisions 
that will kind of help you, and you can write this on your objectives. We treat pulse less, which means no pulse, V tax and V fib exactly the same. So when you learn treatment for one, you know the treatment for the other. So that should help minimize some of your what? Study. There's no sense to separate all things. Pulse less, pulse less. Write the word pulse and add L-E-S-S -S to it. Pulse less, which means no what? Pulse less V tech. V is in ventricular. But what does that V stand for? Ventricular. Tachycardia. It and ventricular. We shorten that by calling it V FIO. And that means fibrillation. And we treat those exactly the same. The algorithm or the recipe for how we treat that is going to be exactly the same. All right, so now the other division on the other side, we treat a systole. Okay, in your book, for some weird reason, you call it ventricular a systole. I have never in my 30 years said, yeah, ventricular asystole. Don't do it. They would say, student. So what are you going to call it? Asystole. But what might you see in this NCLEX world or this ATI world? Ventricular okay. Asystole <laughs> and PEA, which stand for pulse oscillation. Activity. Activity. No. Activity. Close. I'm impressed. You're trying. That's awesome. It's called pulse less electrical activity. We treat those two exactly the same. So once you learn one, you got the other. Okay? Now I'm going to help you with that as we go through and we, we hit the uh, just read me a section. Okay? I got to get back in line for my little OCD Sheldon Cooper thing on it. So we're going to pin the PowerPoint, okay? I'm that way. So this bothers me to a degree, but I want to make sure you understand where I'm testing you. All right? Now, did you see we covered a switch? Which rhythm? We can add one because we started it last semester and we need to finish it this semester. And it's called SVT. What is that? Supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia. SVT. Okay? And the reason we cover SVT is because it's an advanced. You need, you should be ACLS certified when you're pushing something called a denison. And do you hear the N in a denison? N in a denison stands for narrow, in the scooper ten. And narrow complex tract is another term that we use for SVT. And when I say narrow complex, I'm talking about the QRS complex, that thing on the EKG that we count for heart rate, the big one. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Please say you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So what's another term that we use for SVT? Non complex. Narrow oh. complex tachycardia. No. Okay. So if I say narrow complex tachycardia, what also am I referring to? QRS. SVT. Okay. Narrow complex tachycardia, SVT. And that will help you when you're trying to remember the medication you're supposed to give to treat SVT. And you say, oh, that's that N word, narrow, contact, uh, narrow complex tachycardia. The N is real prevalent. It's the word, a den, a sun. Okay? You'll get it. We're going to do that when we cover it. I just thought I'd say it once. Here again. You say it again. We're going to do it. All right. Say it now. <laughs> Hemodynamic monitoring, we covered with a whole page. What's IABT? Intraarterial blood It could be. It could be something else, too. Okay. Let's try this. Ready? Intra aortic. 
balloon pump. All right. So write that down. So do you see why I'm going through your syllabus one by one to make sure you understand what is testable? All right. Do you understand what it means? All right. Those are the ones that we can Let's look at our content. What's A? Cardio. Genic shock. So this is a shock caused because the heart muscle itself can't pump. All right. 40% at least of the left ventricle ain't working. It's dead. 40% of your left ventricle is, at least is dead. So if 40% of your workforce, remember the left ventricle pumps to where? The body. All your body. Mm -hmm. Your whole body. All your vital organs. The left ventricle pumps out to you and feeds. So if 40% of it is not working, you think your patient might go into shock? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this shock is not caused because they don't have blood or volume. What is this shock caused from? Pump. Pump failure. So right next to, right on your objectives, next to cardiogenic shock, this is the worst form of heart failure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. <laughs> okay. So we, we talked about A. Look at B. That's all those rhythms I've already talked to you about it. Look at that. B tap, B fib, A physically called this electrical activity, and there's all your heart block. And I would circle and star third degree. And I'm just going to ask you a question. Oh, I'm sorry, you asked me a question? I'm oh, there. Say that again. Heart block, circle third degree, which is also known as what? Wait, wait, heart block. Very good. i got to ask you something. Heart blocks. Would you, would you agree with me? The word block sounds like something ain't making it through. Yeah. So what kind of rhythm is that? Fast or slow? Slow. Slow. So we also call slow heart rate, what's the other word we call? Brady. Brady. That's all it is, is a braided of heart. And so we are going to treat heart blocks that are symptomatic like we would any other braided of heart. So y'all reach out over this stuff. Okay? So do you remember back in level two? Don't hit me. <laughs> do y'all remember there was a drug that we used to treat bradycardia? Okay. okay. So do y'all remember? I would say you give them 0.5 if they're alive. Do y'all remember that? No. no, no, no. You do now. Okay. <laughs> so atropine, the dose for bradycardia. Yeah. 0.5 if they're alive. All right? And they, and they should be alive if they're a bradycardia. <laughs> they can be symptomatic. A swirl in the drain. You know what I'm saying? Getting close. All right. If they're alive. So what is the, what is the dosage for atropine? 0.5. All right. Now. Keep going. So what's C say? Congenital heart disorders, and that's the pediatric. So write pediatric. See your Perry book. And you see it says tetralogy of below, and it says septal defects. Right in front of the septal defects, there are two of them. There are atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects. Okay? Y'all clear? And this is also written on that sheet I gave you with actual page numbers today. What's D <coughs> say? Coronary artery bypass. Let's say CAB. CABG. And then we'll talk about valve replacement. And do you remember what y'all were running out of the room? I was like, add warfarin. You gotta know warfarin because of that objective. Because valve replacement come in two big divisions. Do you remember them? They can have a tissue valve replacement or they can have a mechanical 
And what's the big deal about the mechanical? That's right. So they have to have some, an anticoagulant, and one of the most common ones is cheese. It's old. It's, I mean, just be honest. It's warfarin. And remember, you have to have labs, and that's a big deal with warfarin. The problem with that, nursing wise, is it's according to why you're taking warfarin, what they're going to expect your INR to be. Y'all remember INR is the thing we track with warfarin, PT and INR, primarily INR. And so when we're giving it for a mechanical valve, we want their INR to be between three and four, which is higher than what you were used to. So make sure you hear me and you repeat that back to me. So if I have a patient who has a mechanical valve and they're taking more, what do I want? Where do I want their INR to be between three and, three and, and four? four? Okay. All right. Sorry, I just saw that. All right. So, we got the valve replacement. And do you see aneurysm repair? Mm -hmm. You got two divisions of this. All right. You got the thoracic aortic aneurysm. That's occurring in your thorax right here. All right, that scares the crap out of me. I just want y'all to know. Because, where is my thoracic aorta? Leslie. Your heart? Your lungs? Think about it. Yeah, I'm proud you're saying that. To cut to get to it. What all you got to get through? Lungs are in my chest, heart is in my chest. Do you think that's an easy surgery? No. What do you think the mortality rate for that is? Uh, what, is an emer what if it's an emergency? Oh. Extremely. Okay. So that's something to think about. Now, if I have an aneurysm, which is a bulging of my oh, aorta, the big old, big old vessel, up here, hmm. right through here, what do you think my symptoms might be? What if that means sore throat? throat? JVD. It might affect my swallowing. Mm -hmm. It might offset something up here. So think big. Think concept. If they have a thoracic aortic aneurysm, their symptoms are going to be where? Below. Does that make sense? Think big. Because if you try to memorize all these symptoms, are you going to remember all that? No. All right, so the other division is what? Abdominal. Then we call it the triple A. That is what we call it in clinical. Because it's an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And they all begin with A. So now, I'll tell you this. Where is that located? Below. 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 Have y'all seen some big old bellies? Yeah. yeah. Side. Well, they got to cut pretty big. Like from can to can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I bet y'all didn't tell your dates then. Can to can. I'm just saying. Just see if you're really listening. Don't record me. Don't put me on social media. I have people after me, so please don't. Okay, I'm serious. All right. So. Abdominal aortic aneurysm. Where are my symptoms? In the stomach. The back pain. Things down there in the abdomen. Where are my tubular pulsation? The abdomen. And it's awful because these patients are typically male and older, and I swear all from leak seal. <laughs> and they'll go, do I feel it? It's really cool. And you're like, don't do that. Because they're not smart enough to realize that what's going to happen if you're pushing on it. So should you push on it? No. But that's why we get you to. It's cool. I'm like, oh, you really don't think it's cool one minute. Okay. All right. Okay. Ooh, here's the lift, right? Okay, now there are other objectives. We were at D and we ended at aneurysm repair and we talked about the two you were responsible for. What are they? Okay. So keep going. Do you see all these are drugs? Mm -hmm. Holy crap. <laughs> all right. Most of these are ACL, a lot of these are ACLS drugs. Okay. 
if I were you, I'd make a card. And I would put, the main thing is, why would I give somebody this? You know what I'm saying? Don't learn classes. Because if you learn classes, and I'll tell you why, many of them fit into about three or four different ones. I don't know why they listed this this way. Okay, so don't get shook up when you realize that some of these drugs fall into multiple different classes. So let me help you. Okay? So I'm going to help you real quick. Adenosine. Woo! We said that word earlier. Mm -hmm. I hear the N real prevalent. SBT. SBT. We use it to treat narrow, complex okay. tachycardia. All right? And we'll talk in detail about that drug when we get to that. All right? So... Atropine, what do we use that for? Heart block. All right, 0.5 still alive. Remember? Mm -hmm. All right, you see the next two and the Oron and lidocaine. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody has heard of lidocaine, and you're used to hearing that word because it's like it does let it know. Mm -hmm. Well, we can give it IV to soothe irritated ventricles. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is an antiarrhythmic, which means it helps to calm down arrhythmias, dysrhythmias. And so lidocaine is a sister, older sister, y'all heard me say that? <laughs> lidocaine is the older chief sister to amiodarone. Amiodarone is also an antiarrhythmic that helps irritated the irritated heart. So, <coughs> which two of those meds are like that I just tell you? Lidocaine and amiodarone. So those two are a lot alike. You can give either one of them for V type. Okay. Next one is F. Y'all see F up here? Mm -hmm. And notice I'm not saying inotropes or whatever they are because they fit into several different categories. So, dopamine. 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 Right next to dopamine, we primarily give that to help get the patient's blood pressure up. We're trying to get their blood pressure up. Now there's this, something tricky with dopamine. Y'all ready? Don't let it trick you up. You have to have a full tank before you give dopamine. So you got to give fluids first or dopamine won't work. So what are we gonna try first when someone's blood pressure is low? Fluid bolus. Fluid bolus. And when someone tells you to give a patient a fluid bolus, like at Medicaid or whatever at ACLS, and they go, they love to ask a nursing student, what well, much? And the full nurses are going to say, about 100 cc? And they'll just laugh. No, a bolus is a thousand cc. It's a liter, at least, if not two. All right. So, what do we give dopamine primarily for? To increase, increase heart rate, blood, blood pressure. pressure. Increase blood pressure. Primarily used to increase blood pressure. We can also give dopamine, and there's something, let me say this. When we're trying to get someone's blood pressure up that has a thick heart, <laughs> dopamine's one of those drugs that you gotta watch because it can also increase the heart rate. And so, if that patient with a thick heart, you increase their heart rate, you're working that heart. Harder, aren't you? So if you're working the heart harder, is that a good thing for somebody with a sick heart? No. no. So would that be something reportable if you had a dopamine infusion going and their heart rate jacked up? Mm -hmm. you, better, you better tell somebody. I don't know if it's working, but you better tell somebody. Um, the other right. thing that might happen to them when you put them on a dopamine with a sick heart is they might start having chest pain. And if they're having chest pain, that's also something you would need to do what? Record. Record. And we might have to back off the dopamine and try something else. So if I told you that one of the things dopamine can do is it causes an increase in the heart rate, does it make sense to you that when we don't have a pacemaker readily available for somebody and we're, atropine didn't work, 
that another drug that we might do is dopamine. But it's not first line for bradycardia. What's first line? Dopamine. Okay. But I like to explain to you that sometimes dopamine is given for a slow heart rate too, and that helps you to remember that one of the things that can happen when you start someone on a dopamine drip because their blood pressure was low, we're trying to get the blood pressure up, it can also increase the heart rate. And is that something you need to call about? Yes. Okay. What about dobutamine? It sounds like dopamine, huh? But when you go in the hospital and that little computer system, it'll say, Be careful. Same name. It's not really the same name, but it it sound the same. Okay. These can be easily confused. So make sure you get this right. <laughs> Okay, however you need to get it. Dopamine we use to treat what? All right, so we're trying to get their blood pressure up. All right, dobutamine. What is dobutamine given for primarily? There's a clinic that we have nowadays to try to keep people out of the hospital. It's called a CHF clinic. We treat heart failure a lot with dobutamine. Okay, dobutamine is truly... An inotrope. What does that mean? You know what that means? If I'm giving it for heart failure, and heart failure means they have a sick heart, weak heart, inotrope, the word inotropic means it helps to increase contraction, the strength of contraction. Increase the strength of contraction. So when you read that a drug has inotropic effects, it means what? Okay. okay. So if I told you we were giving dobutamine to someone, we do it to increase their cardiac output. Because if you're increasing the strength of contraction, if it's pushing harder, are you increasing the cardiac output? Mm -hmm. So what's the primary reason you give somebody dobutamine? Okay. To increase cardiac output. Right. Increase cardiac output. So why do we give dobutamine? To increase cardiac output. Why do we give dopamine? To increase blood pressure. Okay, you got them straight. I hate that the right side of the Okay, epinephrine. First it. First drugs give all the people. It don't matter if they're an infant or an old lady. I don't care how old you are. You dead, that's the first drug you get. No matter what. No matter what. No matter what rhythm, no matter what. No max dose. Okay. You see it says it's a vasopressor, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Epi is another one that if... So what does that mean before I go further? Vasopressor. The same it's thing as I said, vasoconstrictor. Mm -hmm. So what does it do? Constricts. It's it's the the or shunts blood to the vital organs where it needs to be. Okay? Trying to keep people alive. Well, the other thing that epinephrine also can do is if you are panicking because we can't get the pacemaker to work, okay, and the atropine didn't work, and we don't have any dopamine, we can, we can give a little epinephrine to increase their heart rate too, but that is second line, okay? I don't care if you remember that. That is just something good to know sometimes when you're panicking. <laughs> All right, do you see where they put... Dobutamine and dopamine and all that down here too? Mm -hmm. Don't freak out. Do I want you to know it falls into all these places? Mm -hmm. You ain't gonna get no test question that easy. All right, we got to have a patient, a nurse, and we gotta apply. All right, and I want you to be able to operate. Okay, so let's go to norepinephrine. The other word for that that you hear in, this, in the ICUs a lot is called levofed. L E Z O P H E D. Levo Fed. That is the brand name for Nor Epi. And that's what we sure want to call it, Nor Epi. And we call it Leave Them Dead. It is one of those drugs that we're, it's actually easily titrated, so we like it when we're trying to keep someone's output going, getting them any kind of pressure whatsoever. We're trying to keep them what? A lot. So that's not a frontline drug. It's not something you're going to give them a code. That's something you're going to see in the ICU give. Okay? 
And why do you think they call it leave them dead? <coughs> it's, it's a last kind of ditch effort. We're trying to keep them alive. Do you think that all sick people live? Mm -hmm. No. Is it the drug's fault? Mm -hmm. No, but they really didn't think hard when they named it, did they? <laughs> you have to, when you name your babies, you guys don't have to think about all this. But I do. I had a friend, and her last name was O. Her initial was O. And she was like, I'm going to call her Brianna or so. I said, then they're going to call her B.O. No, you're not. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to think of these things. But anyway, okay. All right. So, Nora up in there, friends, it does call vasoconstriction. It's a vasopressor primary. Is it something you're going to give during a code? No. no. Is it something they hang a lot on patients who are in shock trying to get their pressures up? Yes. Okay. All right, you see dopamine and abumin again? Don't let that bother you. Just be glad that's one less dopamine. You know, come on, a lot of repeats in here. All right, on I, what do you see? Sodium nitroprusside. Does that sound like nitroglycerin? Mm -hmm. So it also causes vasodilation. Ooh, what does that do? Vasodilation. It helps. Yeah, you're right. So if, if I say vasodilation to your vessels, that causes your blood pressure to do what? Draw. So what do you think we use that for? You will have blood pressure. High blood pressure. High blood pressure. Trying to get their pressure down very, very, very fast. Okay? And give it to you right in your IV. And that's kind of a cool drug. If you go in the ICU, it's one of those drugs that they're going to have that. It looks like full paper over it, protecting it from the light. Mm -hmm. it's very light sensitive, so that's something you probably need to know. And this drug, sometimes in the book, is written sodium nitroprusside. And sometimes you'll look in the book, or a different book, and it will say nitroprusside sodium. Who cares? You know what we call it? Nitro. You got your nitro grip going? I mean, y'all know we short sure everything. So don't stress over the little stuff. But I will have a student every semester. We choose it. It's either. <laughs> All right. Do y'all see Jay? Do y'all see Jay? Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, I can't say those words. So let me tell you what they are in the real world. You ready? Reacro and Integral. All right. And here's what I want you to know about these. They are IV antiplatelets. I call them IV aspirins. <laughs> Don't tell me that. All right, but that, that's really kind of what it is. It's given IV. We give it a lot of times after someone has a heart attack. And they're going to the cath lab. Maybe it's an end semi. And so, you know, we don't want to, during a heart cath, they got that wire feeding it up there. Can they break some of that plaque off or the thrombus off? Mm -hmm. That's why they do that. They give them those IV antiplatelet meds. What lab do you think we check if it's a platelet? We monitor their platelet very closely when they're receiving those two drugs. And in the real world, they will blow your mind because they will say something bizarre. They call these... I have to look at it. GP 2B380 receptor antagonist, but in the real world they'll call them rear prone antagonist. And it's just they're known as GP 2B38. They're also known as phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Do I want you to use all that? Mm -hmm. No. What do I want you to know? That they're used as anti platelets. So, what does your platelets do? They form clots. So if you're really, really, really low, what is the risk? Gotta bleed out. Yeah. Bleed out. This is a high risk drug. And I'm going to tell you, we've had some horrendous incidents from this drug because, like, patients trans transfer a lot. Like, if they're having a heart attack, mm -hmm. they go from the ER to the cath lab. Mm -hmm. And then in the cath lab, they're changing over. And we will, for one, at one point in time, according to where you work, we change the what? When we transfer the IV pump. Yeah. And so if you're moving fluids and the integralin and all that stuff over on pumps in a hurry, what if you program the integralin at the rate of the IV fluids, and the IV fluids at the rate of the integralin, and you forget or miss it? 
Somebody can die. Can somebody die? Project Sharp. Has that happened? Yeah. It, it, look, it's a chill on me. Yes. So, should that happen? No. no. So, what's the risk with the antiplatelet IV meds? Bleeding. Bleeding. And what lab are you going to check? Antiplatelets. Okay. Now, you feel like you are clarified. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Do you think you can make some med cards and not just with what I've told you, but what what I've told you should be on there? Like, <laughs> Y'all really? Okay. Now, dash diet. My story. Low what? Sorry. Thank you, Jesus. All right. <laughs> I'm so TLC diet. Okay. And cholesterol. And does it taste good? No. no. Okay. <laughs> All right, wait. What is your... Okay, you. I got a friend back here who is just saying... She's like, don't look at me. You can help me with the... Okay. Got me. I love that. Okay. Y'all will appreciate her because I can't remember a break to save my life. She's lost. I'm not too much. <laughs> All right, we have to do a quick review. Do you remember coronary artery disease? Do you remember a lot of that? Yes. No, 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 no. Okay. And all you know is the other patients did. All right, coronary artery disease. We talk about coronary artery disease, we talk about what? Angina. And what else? Am I? Are there a couple of flavors of angina? You got chronic stable, you got unstable, and then you got am I? So we moved from, eh, you got a little problem there, <laughs> to oh my God, all right? And it's a continuum, but you really do need to understand the differences. All right? You're going to have a test on this today. I got a whole from the other class. Okay. So, when I say MI, what is I heart? In front of Very good. Which means cell. Yeah. All right, with chronic stable angina, you're talking about a difference between supply and demand, right? Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. So why is the chest hurting in the patient? Because it's not getting enough oxygen, right? And so what can this patient, is this predictable? Yes. The patient typically knows when it's going to occur. You know, when I walk to the mail, all the way to my mailbox, I live in Leakesville, so I have to walk a mile to my mailbox. And so I know that when I do that, I'm going to get what? Chest pain. And so how does that person usually treat that kind of pain? What's the first thing they do when they're walking to their mailbox and their chest starts hurting? They stop. They rest because they're trying to decrease the demand on the heart. Does that make sense? Okay, and then they they don't have no oxygen. They might have oxygen up their lip seal. You know what I mean? They might be taking their oxygen to the nail box. So, do y'all remember oh my oxygen monitor? I think Ms. Cooper calls it her cuss word at the hospital instead of O S H I T, but I did not say that. Okay, because I get trouble. So, the O is oxygen, the M is monitor, and the I is IV. Okay, well, we can't do all that up in Leakesville, but the man can stop. He can take some deep breaths to get the oxygen in. And sometimes the chest pain does what? It goes away. And then, if he's like my little grandma, if it don't, he'll just reach up in his pocket because everybody in Leakesville has a pocket. And then he's going to take what? Nitro. Nitro. And then that should do what? Relieve it. So it's chronic, it's stable, he knows when it's going to occur, it's predictable. Are you with me? Okay, he has no elevation in what? Enzymes, he has really no um, big changes on this one. EKG, the time for that is less than 15 minutes. You with me? Y'all okay. remember all this? Okay. So when I say acute coronary syndrome, I'm talking about two things. What am I talking about? Unstable what? Vagina. And the word one. Am I? Am I? Okay, so with unstable angina, this is occurring not predictably anymore. That chest pain can occur at rest. It can occur at any time. And there are different variations of unstable angina, and I can make your head spin. You don't have to know. 
But when they come in and you read Prince Metals or Variant Angina, that is an unstable angina, a type of it. Now that one's special because this patient, the reason that's happening to this patient is vasospasm. So they're having these vasospasms in their coronary artery, which is causing what? The, is the blood flow to what? Sure. Stop. Because it's clamped down like this. You with me? The treatment for that one's a little bit different. If you remember that, good. If you don't, I don't care. But I think it's good that you know that so that you realize that the treatment is different for that patient versus someone else. You with me? Okay, so unstable angina. This one is starting to take longer. It, the pain stays longer, right? Instead of just 15 minutes, it could be longer than that. So remember, it's continuum. We're moving towards MI if we don't do something about this unstable angina. You, you understanding? All right, so with this patient, you might start seeing changes on their EKG. Changes like ischemia, which means ST segment what? Mm -hmm. Depression. Another thing that could be ischemia is T wave what? Inversion. inversion. Well, that T wave inversion could also be an electrolyte. Potassium. Potassium, low potassium. So, you know, we're going to check it. We're going to drop some laps in that man hits the door. Or woman. All right. So, you kind of understand the things? So, what about enzymes with unstable angina? High. They're not elevated. They're not elevated. Yes. They're not elevated. Yeah. We're just it's talking about time. unstable angina. You're starting to see changes of ischemia, not infarct, ischemia, which means it's deprived of what? Oxygen. Oxygen. You might or might not. Okay? But you might see it on the EKG. Just say. But the enzymes tell you that there's tissue death or damage, right? Okay. <laughs> and so with MI, when we say MI, that's when your enzymes are going to be what? Elevated. And let me finish this sentence and y'all go pee. All right. So do you remember the enzymes? Tell them quick. Y'all got to pee. Troponin, C and B, and what else? Which two are cardiac specific? SCKMB. Which one is the most novel and we like it the most because it's quick? Troponin. But, but, there's a big but here. CKMB, if you catch it right, is actually the more specific one to myocardial infarction. Interesting, isn't it? But let me tell you what Ms. Cooper knows. Why do you think they draw more than one? Remember, I, remember I talked about this. The amount of time. Number one is timing. Mm -hmm. But number two, we have train wrecks as patients. I'm sorry. Do you know what I mean? It means they have everything wrong with them. So they may have a little heart failure. They may have kidney disease. They may have systemic lupus. Go on with this and that. And so sometimes their enzymes are going to be a little elevated anyway. So which one's more specific to MI, CKMB, but more reliably so if they are all doing what? Elevated. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so things are starting to come together. Are you included? <laughs> 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 